great. A warm welcome to James Newell from Clear Sales Message. Now, if you're still leaving your sales to chance, then keep listening. And uh, thanks again for joining us, James, to take us on this really exciting journey. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great. Now, if you think pickup lines don't work, well, you may be correct in a bar, but in business they do. And actually the way that James and I met was James sent me a LinkedIn message. And I'm sure those of you out there also get a high volume of messages on LinkedIn, which you probably ignore. James's message stuck out because the first line had asterisks either side of it and said, simplifying complex offerings. And as someone who gets lots of pitch decks and works with a lot of entrepreneurs, I know how difficult it really can be to distill your message and convey it in a very succinct way. Um, and so I immediately got in touch with James and said, you know, this is a breath of fresh air. Why don't you come on a webinar and help educate uh, some of our entrepreneurs? And then, of course, it would be remiss of me not to invite him on the Tippy Top podcast. So here we are today. Thanks again for joining us, James. Delighted to have you. My pleasure. Now, uh, James, you've got a, a very uh, interesting and relevant background uh, to your uh, current offering of Clear Sales Message, and there's a reason why you're, you're uh, sitting in this seat. Do you want to give us a brief overview of your history to date? Yeah, sure. So, a brief, brief overview of my history was I worked in sales, well, worked worked in sales for about 12 years for Daimler Mercedes Benz in the UK. I was a key account manager for them. I did incredibly well. Um, but I was deeply, deeply unhappy, as lots of people are once you've been in a job for a long time. And I really wanted to break out and work for myself. Again, very popular thing to do. But I had no idea what I wanted to do. So in about 2016, 2017, I started to experiment with some clients that weren't paying me at the time to understand how I could help them to sell more and to improve their performance. And clear sales message came from that. And it's almost flippant when I explain this to people. But if I ask you what you do, why I should choose you over the competition, why you're so expensive, or any number of quite standard issue customer questions, that's enough to floor most people. So these three clients that I, I call them clients, so these three clients that I work with, first question was, tell me all about your business. And you either get an answer that's too short, and you're left one, I'm a photographer, that's it, you're left one thing. It's too long, and then you're answering the question for, oh, so, so you're a photographer, right? so you're filling in the gaps for them because you haven't got half an hour, or there's too much jargon or whatever. So the first thing I did was just to simplify their value proposition, and just answer those really basic, obvious questions. What do you actually do? And really important question, why should anybody care? Because that's how we judge things. That's how consumers judge everything. We don't verbalize it, but that's how we judge the world. And from there, had traction, realized that it was uh, something I had an actual uh, skill for. And the rest, as they say, is history. Here we are. Lovely. Well, that's great. And I'm really looking forward to this episode. And what we've had on the show, as, as the listeners will know, is we've had a lot of people talking about the alignment between entrepreneurs and investors. However, the smart entrepreneurs know that the best place to look for money is your customers. And once you get proper customer, uh, you know, product market fit, that's when the investors pile in. So if you have, you know, limited resource, the guidance is always focus on your customers. And that's why we have James to, to help us understand what customers want and how to communicate with them. And as usual, we have our three main topics. And these are based on videos that James uh, has already put out. And um, there's an impressive repository out there. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, distribute the links later. In terms of the topics, we've got sell the destination, not the journey. Point two is the trigger point, obviously pertaining to sales. And number three, the named process effect. And that's going to be a particularly thought provoking one. Now, sticking on number one, sell the destination, not the journey. Uh, James has a really good saying that nobody buys a plane seat, everyone buys a holiday. And, and when you say it like that, James, it really does make so much sense. And even reading it last night, do you want to tell us why so many people get this wrong? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first thing that I did when I started out in business was I wanted to understand why everybody had this problem. Nobody, I say nobody's being very sweeping here, but most people find it quite difficult to articulate what they do, et cetera, et cetera. But why is that? What, what, what is the reasoning? If I can understand and explain that, then that's going to add sort of weight to my work and help me to, to serve my clients better. So I came across something called the false, as in incorrect, false consensus effect. Now, the false consensus effect states that you see the world from your point of view. So you talk about things that matter to you in terms you understand, and you pretty much expect everybody else to have the same understanding, the same 
consensus because the alternative is just mind boggling. You can't imagine different ages, races, genders, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of have to do that. But in doing so, we focus on the things that we like, which are often the features and the boring parts of boring to our clients, at least the boring parts of our offering, rather than what your clients really want, which is to solve a problem or meet a need. So this is where that classic features and benefits kind of paradigm comes into play. And we are naturally just averse to doing this. We, we operate and talk about things that matter to us first and foremost, always. And we disconnect. So I use this um, idea of um, airlines and travel agents, etc. When you see an, an airline advert, you very rarely see a plane or a plane seat in that advert, very rarely. And that's because they know you're buying holiday. You're buying, actually, you're buying more than the holiday. You're buying the feeling of being on holiday, the relaxation, the relief, the family time, whatever it happens to be. And they know that they need to connect with you on that level first before they can then tell you about a plane seat. So it's changing the syntax, just changing the order of what we talk about. And that's what makes all the difference. One of my main kind of sayings is that selling is about really good communication and finding a connection point. And that's how we do it. And it's called the false consensus effect. Okay. And taking a step back, and you, you mentioned briefly uh, earlier why you started Clear Sales Message, and what was the main problem that you actually saw that led you to go on this really uh, long journey of creating all the videos and content and training and webinars and, uh, and, and all the consulting you do? Well, there's three main problems that people face. So the first one is people have either got a technically difficult offering or it's a large offering and you just can't get it across in a, in a few seconds or in a sentence or whatever. So it's just too technically sophisticated, too large to explain. The second one is people work in commoditized me too marketplaces, where everybody pretty much does the same thing. So you can only really differentiate on price. We find it very difficult. And you know, we try and differentiate, differentiate with we're professional, we're reliable, we're affordable, rather than talking about what really matters. And the final piece, and I hate the term justifying, but the final piece is justifying the price. So if you've got a very intangible offering, like I do, it's a consulting offering, it's quite intangible. Or if you have a very high priced offering, sometimes it can be difficult for customers and clients to connect with what they're actually getting and, and justifying the price. So too technical, hard to differentiate or hard to justify the price. Those were the three main areas that I noticed very quickly that stem from this whole issue of the false consensus effect. And that's why I spend most of my time. And in any given business, you're gonna be hit by one, two or, or all three of them. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see that a hell of a lot. And in terms of being educated, now I'm sure there's a way to know what you know, but it's going to be quite a journey. Besides watching your uh, impressive YouTube videos and TikToks, I might add, uh, how do entrepreneurs learn about all these skills? Because as you say, it's not natural. I think it's almost like our brains go inwards and say, oh, that's too scary and stick to what we know. And we need to step out of that. What's the best way to break that uh, those mental models if you like so the best way to do it um apart from obviously watching my my videos or you know watching any videos on, on, on youtube about this kind of stuff but the best thing that i found is that think about how you would behave as a buyer and what you would like and that's generally a really nice kind of guiding star as to how to behave in a selling conversation or anything like that you see, as buyers, we don't like to be chased and harangued. We don't like to feel like we're not in control, et cetera. And yet when we're in the selling position, we follow people up industry. We try and bully them into buying from us, et cetera. We behave very differently in those two different scenarios. So one of the things I say to my clients and students, yes, we've got all this kind of psychological behavioral side of things, but often the best marker, the best question is, if I was buying in a situation, would I be comfortable with getting an email just saying have you got any questions just checking in just touching base etc because you probably wouldn't be so why are you then doing it yourself so how you would behave as a buyer is often a really great uh, sort of natural guiding star i find and also to keep people behaving naturally and normally because when it comes to sales we feel like we have to behave like wolf of wall street gordon gecko all these kind of macho characters i'm definitely going to close you on this call alex either you're going to close me or i'm going to close you all this kind of high pressured stuff take it back to communication take it back to what feels comfortable and natural and you'll be streets ahead of most people lovely and, and I've actually downloaded and listened to a portion of, I think it's called The Way of the Wolf by Jordan Belfort, that hard-nosed selling or whatever it is. Yeah. Not a recommended read in your view? 
Well, they all, they all have their own individual merits and everybody's got their own individual style. I'm mm. just not comfortable when we're taking sort of control away from the buyer and we're trying to get them to do things that perhaps aren't best for them. My approach mm. to selling is you've got to, you've got to achieve two really important things. If, if this was a selling conversation, two very important things. First one is information. I've got to give you everything that you need to make the best decision for yourself. So that comes down to giving you a really clear articulation of what I offer and why that might benefit you. So that's information and then opportunity. So I've got to ask you for the business. I can't not ask you for the business, but not in a persuasive way. So Alex, everything is there, blah, 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 blah. How does that sound to you? Does that sound like something that you'd like to work with, you'd like to go for? But the decision is yours. So there's never any pressure when, when I'm selling, but in those kind of Wolf of Wall Street-esque things, it feels like we're trying to achieve our objectives as sellers rather than help our buyers achieve their objectives, which is really short-term thinking. Makes for a good movie, but it's short-term thinking. I like that. And in terms of the, the relationship between uh, entrepreneurs and investors, there's obviously the, the VCs now, especially they're so awash with cash, they're selling themselves to the entrepreneurs saying, take our money above the competition. And obviously the entrepreneurs are pitching and we're all quite familiar with that. How does that feed what you've just said, feed into that in terms of you know, selling, trying to close, persuasive language, uh, communication? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's exactly the same. In any given scenario, what you've really got to understand is what are you really selling? Because you're never really selling the thing you think you're selling. So for my own business, Clear Sales Message, the actual deliverable is a set of messaging guidelines and a clear articulation of what we do and what we offer and how it works, et cetera, et cetera, and objection and all the kind of really detailed granular stuff. But I know firsthand that what my clients are really buying is a sense of confidence so they can actually articulate in a situation and not be caught off guard by a very simple question why should we choose you over the competition for example they might be buying pride and achievement because they're trying to hit certain revenue numbers etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can nearly always trace back what you're really selling to something human an emotion and if you can get under the skin of that and understand that this isn't so we can manipulate people or, or do anything of that order, but we make sure we talk in terms that are going to resonate. But the decision is always with the buyer. So for mm. the VCs, for example, if they're trying to get people interested in them, <laughs> conversely, if, if they're awash with, cash, awash with cash, why would I why would I work with this VC over this one? Because a million pounds is a million pounds. So what, what can you offer me? What can you offer me? Mm. And it will almost certainly come down to something that's quite human centric, human nature, some feeling, some emotion. So you're never mm. really selling what you're selling, which is a bit meta um, and a bit hard to get your head around to begin with. But once you understand that, you can then shortcut how you communicate with people mm. and people just magically resonate and connect with you. Mm. Yeah, I've certainly seen that in you know, VCs winning deals, as it were, from entrepreneurs when they not, the, you know, the VCs are not paying the top valuation um, and don't necessarily have the best terms in terms of fees, but the entrepreneur trusts them. They're buying that trust and can I work with you for five to seven years? And that's why a lot of VCs spend a lot of time building relationships because you know, good ones, good entrepreneurs and VCs know that's what it's all about. It's not about money. That is just a means to an end. Exactly. Which again is selling the destination, not the journey, right? And knowing to focus on the right thing. Absolutely. Well said. Now, Point number two, the trigger point, and and I, I did a bit of research on all of these, so I'm already uh, uh, you know well well apprised on on these new techniques, and hope to put them to use. And and just for the listeners' benefit, as I say, there are hundreds of videos out there that James has created, and we've between us we've picked these three because we think these are the really key ones that you're going to need to succeed in your business. Now, the trigger point uh, is defined as something that drives your client to need your offering and not at any point in time right now when you're having the conversation with them. Now, this one is so relevant to startups, and uh, it's just moved from position one to position two on CB Insights. The number two now reason why startups fail is because there's no market need. And for the uh, listeners out there, you'll know the number one reason now is because they fail to raise follow-on capital. But, but let's stick. There's still a very high proportion of businesses that don't, um, yeah, don't have an offering that anyone wants. Now, can entrepreneurs fix this by using this trigger point method, or is it just fine tuning and a really strong uh, value proposition, James? So the trigger point isn't necessarily about product market fit that needs to exist. The trigger point is about the, the speed, the velocity of working with people. So often, oftentimes we have 
avatars, defined market segmentation that we're looking at and that we're pursuing. So we know who, we, who we're looking for, but we don't often know when. So I see this very often that we just talk to people at the wrong time. So it's the right people at the wrong time, which sounds really simple, but that can literally make or break your business because if they're not buying right now, that they're not buying right now and you've wasted your time. So the trigger point is something, again, it's very basic and, and obvious to address, but missed by many people. And it could be as simple as a fixed date in the calendar, you know, personal tax, 31st of January, that kind of thing could be a fixed date in the calendar. It could be an event that occurs, a birth, a marriage, a death, a new job, whatever. It could be a surplus of something. So if I have too much rubbish at my house, I call a rubbish removal company, for example. If I have a lack of something, not enough sales. I need a sales consultant. So there's a number of different things that trigger people. And one of the best ways to find it, if you already have some degree of market traction, is to study who is already buying from you and working with you and try and understand, and if you're friendly with them, ask them, what drove them to speak with you? And, and what was that situation like for them? Because that's where the clues lie. And that's how we can further connect with people. I always use the example of kind of a, a leaky tap or, or a flat tire. So flat tire is my trigger point to go to quick fit or whatever to get a tire. Until that point, I'm not in the market for tires, even though I own them. So it's what, if you understand that, how do you then find all of the people with flat tires? How do you find those people experiencing that same trigger point in a group or in a, in a huddle, as it were? That's the most effective use of your marketing budget and your marketing energy. It's not as straightforward to find that, I agree. But understanding the triggers, very important. Mm. As you say, not, not easy, but at least if you have that goal in mind, you've got a far greater chance of success. It's, it's sim simple, but not easy, but fundamental as far as I'm concerned. If you don't know the, the trigger points that drive people to buy your offering, then you're almost working on borrowed time. Mm. And leaving your, your sales to chance as well, yeah, like your, chance, your that's right. yeah, <laughs> hashtag, hashtag uh, clear sales message, TM, <laughs> copyright. Um, now, the, and actually the, the thing that came to mind there was, you know, investors are always like too early, not now, la, 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 la. And for the entrepreneur's benefit, and, and particularly those in the UK, you see this absolute flick flack in terms of behavior, uh, investors doing somersaults to try get into businesses between January and March. Why? Because the tax year end is in April. I think it's about 5th of April. And all of a sudden, you know, about 70%, I believe, of EIS deals are done in th that three month window. So if you're going to launch a crowdfunding campaign, launch it in January, you're probably going to be closed by the end of February. Launch it in, in May, and your your odd, the odds are really stacked against you. So finding that buying signal from investors as well, great. Now, in terms of I've often heard about uh, buying signals in a room, and really well trained salespeople, entrepreneurs know how to identify the subtle nuances that people in the room are ready to buy. To, you know, know when to stop talking and push for the close. How yeah. do you identify these? Well, again, I go back to that notion a minute ago of what would you be doing if you were interested in something? You'd be asking questions. You'd be looking for specific details and things that are going to be really meaningful. So timescales, budgets, proof of past work, warranties and guarantees, things that depend on the offering, of course. But questions that are around kind of the efficacy of the offering and how that might resolve my, my issue. One of my I do a lot of work in objection handling with clients and how to tell when an objection is real or false. One of my favorite ones is, you know, oh, just send me a brochure or just call, call back another time or whatever. Can we have some more information? And if you can challenge that and say, well, yeah, absolutely. What, what is it specifically you'd like to know? If there isn't anything specific they'd like to know, then that's, an, that's just a polite objection to get rid of you. If they say, well, actually, really like to know from a Mercedes, you know, what's a turning circle in millimeters, blah, blah, blah. Ah, oh, interesting. Let me tell you. Why do you ask that? Well, I've got a garage and da, 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 da. That's a huge buying signal because it's very specific to their circumstance and it's very specific. If you get broad, generalized feedback, just send me the brochure. Or, Thanks for your time. We'll be in touch, et cetera. And there's no real engagement or connection. Then for me, that's a bit of a red flag that perhaps there is no interest. It's not 100%, but it's quite likely that there's, there's no interest. So what we're looking for are specifics. And again, if you were buying something, you would want to, if you were serious about buying something, you would want to know, you know, how does it get delivered? When will it come, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. look for those things in your bias. Great. And, and do you think we'd see a progression in terms of 
all right, what colors do you have? And then getting right down to, okay, can you tell me the, the, the cubic volume of the engine and then going down to the millimeters in terms of the turning circle? Would you see that and say, are we getting warmer and closer towards the sail? Yes, absolutely. But there's something else that you can do to kind of um, sort of litmus test that, which I've already mentioned, which is ask this great question. What makes you say that? Or why are you asking that question? Because most people will just answer that question immediately and give you the, the truth as it were. So we tend to work from symptom to cause when it comes to objections. So, oh, just send me some information. Yes, what would you like? Why, why are you saying, oh, you're really expensive. Oh, really? Why would you, what's making you say that? Uh-huh. We go from symptom to cause and then we get into specific. So asking that question, what makes you say that? Or, or why, would you, why would you like to know that? Mm-hmm. That could help guide you and that could help you to understand if they're really interested or if they're just sort of asking for more detail. Mm-hmm. And what's really coming through in everything you're saying is focusing on them, not on you. It's a hundred percent. And that's why I take issue with things like Wolf of Wall Street, et cetera, because Mm. that's about putting my needs as a seller above the needs of the buyer. And guess what? If you're buying from me now and I railroaded you into buying something from me, you're not going to feel great about that. We might unwind the transaction afterwards. It doesn't work for my reputation, et cetera. Nobody wins. But in the moment, it feels like I've done the right thing and I'm being productive. So there's this huge red herring in sales that I have to sell you at all costs, regardless, because it feels quite dangerous to say, here's everything, Alex, would you like to buy yes or no? And the decision is yours. And I kind of mm-hmm. step away and let you decide. That feels dangerous for some reason. But for me, that's the only way. And that's how we like to buy. When we're buying something, we like to be in control of the decision. The reason we don't like salespeople is we think we're going to get railroaded into something that perhaps we don't want. And because I don't know about you, but I'm too bloody polite to say anything in the moment. So I'll just agree to things and, and not challenge things because you don't want to cause a scene, particularly if you're in a shop. Mm. But it doesn't feel good. No, it doesn't. And and uh, with the advent of the Consumer Protection Act and, you know, that give it back after 14 days and all that, that's really changed things, which I don't think Jordan Belfort had to experience in his time. (laughs) (laughs) Great. And um, in terms of, we, we, you know, we talked about, you know, identifying buying signals in the traditional way that we sell in the way that you sold your Mercedes. Has that changed a lot with selling on Zoom? You know, presuming you can sell a Mercedes via Zoom. Now, I, I don't think there will be some difference, but I've not noticed anything. I mm. work to um, something that's called emotional contagion. So whilst I'm really into language and how we explain things, how we communicate, there is a huge amount of energy transfer that goes on in real life and on a Zoom call. If I started to lie to you now about something, talk about something that I don't know about or make something up, mm. you will feel a shift in my energy. You won't tell me that you felt it, but you will definitely feel it. And that comes through on Zoom as it does in real life. So I don't think there probably will be some differences somewhere because you do do lose a bit of spontaneity when it comes to Zoom. But fundamentally, I think you can still use Zoom and Teams and whatever else to sell and to communicate and to build relationships because it comes down to the energy factor because you can tell immediately whether I know what I'm talking about or not. And if I go off on on a tangent or if I lose my thread, I'll lose my thread and I probably already have this conversation. And you'll feel that. It's really interesting. And if you can pick up on that, And this comes back to one of the kind of main tenets I speak with my clients and students about, which is confidence, certainty and expertise. Even the slightest lack of confidence in me communicating with you now, you ask me a question about my offering and I don't have an answer or I do, but you felt that I really had to push that a little bit. That could be enough to put you off, Mm -hmm. which is the importance of having all of your ducks in the row and being able to answer those difficult questions such as, you know, well, why should we choose it? We already use somebody else, James. Why would why would we work with you? How do we know if you're any good, et cetera? If you're not ready for that, you will lack that confidence and that could be enough to, to destroy the relationship and the conversation. Mm, it's really subtle, as you say, and often entrepreneurs say, what's the best pitch deck? And you're like, look, it's just an <laughs> intro document. You're going to have to stand in front of investors and explain yeah. the proposition. You've got to know your numbers down to a T. If you don't know last year's revenue, as you say, that could be a make or break of the deal. And you've spent... Yeah. 10,000 pounds on this beautiful pitch deck that gets you absolutely nowhere. Absolutely. Great. Okay, super. Let's go on to number three, the named process effect. Now, uh, many people won't know what that is. I didn't, but do you want to just tell us a bit more about it to start with? Yeah, sure. It kind of segues on nicely from this kind of conversation piece. So when we're talking with, with clients, it always makes me smile when I say this. 
but we want to sound like we know what we're talking about because obviously we know what we're talking about we know what we're talking about or at least we should do because we're expert at what we do and we can get the results etc but sounding like you know what you're talking about does take a little bit more effort so being able to articulate how you do what you do your process of working i found a really effective means of bridging that gap and also for some businesses it's a great differentiator but over and above that, it really gives people this sense, always makes you smile when I say this, but it sounds like you know what you're talking about. So having an, a process of working, whether that's step one, step two, step three, or it's cyclical or whatever, it almost doesn't really matter what it is. But if you can articulate how you work or what sits behind your methodology, particularly if you have an intangible offering like I do, then it can add a little bit of weight. I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. The clear in clear sales message is actually an acrostic. So each letter in the word clear stands for something because very early on when i started this business i was challenged with what do you mean by clear what does that actually mean and i didn't have an answer for it at the time which is really embarrassing and kind of this is where i learned my lessons about being prepared etc as, as i went on my journey so i created the acrostic five different segments to it how do i know if something is clear so this c is for client focus there's a lot of what we've been talking about here being focused on the client L is for logical, seems really obvious, but talking about things in a logical, orderly fashion. So client focused, logical, engaging, talking about the right things, selling the destination, not the journey, accurate. You've got your numbers, you've got your figures, you can back it up. And it's just honest and truthful. It makes sense. Which I feel like I shouldn't have to say, but it's important. So client focused, logical, engaging, accurate. And then finally, results driven. Every communication has, has a purpose. So why are you writing this email, this blog post, recording this uh, uh, webinar, whatever? That's the final piece. So when I can articulate to my clients without preparation and without notes, looking them directly in the eye or the lens in this case, and say, look, it's client focused, logical, engaging, accurate results. I can go off around the house with more detail on that. It should give them a sense that I know what I'm talking about. And that's the importance of having a, a process and then giving it a name or giving it an articulation. Now, in terms of uh, other probably consumer businesses that have employed this technique, uh, do you have any examples that, you know, we would just know offhand that you're like, oh, yeah, that's obvious. Well, um, the simplest one that comes to mind, which is so simple, it almost isn't kind of the process of working, but it's something like wash and go, the shampoo people. So they've made how you use their product into the name of the product. It's so simple that you understand that you can just do it and the conditions in, etc. Obviously, I'm a big fan. The conditions in, etc. And then you can leave and that's it. But having that that process of people want to know how you're going to do something, how it works for the pure reason of they want elimination of risk. They want to know if, if it's going to be suitable for them. So Wash and Go is a really um, prime example because they turn it into the name of the offering overall, which is a, a really strong thing to do. Absolutely. Good one. Okay. And if entrepreneurs out there want to find a name for their own process, maybe they're a B2B SaaS, so business to business, software as a service offering, how would you go about finding a name? Obviously, you've got a very good one for clear sales message. Now, how do I replicate that? How do, what do I look for? There's a number of different ways to do it. Um, a couple of things you can do. First thing is kind of actually talk about the end result. So, so we have sort of the, the descriptor word and then we have something again which might be system method methodology process whatever stick any of those into a thesaurus look at synonyms and ironically the name itself almost doesn't even matter the fact that it has a name is what matters because having a, when something has a name it has implied value so you could have the the end result so the relaxation method or something like that for example you could have something you could ch choose um uh, an object or an animal or a person that has qualities that align with your business and what you're doing so it's like you know the black panther method or something like that there's lots of different ways that, that you can do it mm. ultimately you just want something that's going to be easy to read write speak and spell which again sounds achingly obvious for me to say but very important easy to read write speak and spell and whatever the name is just the fact that it has a name is important because it has implied value if I say, well, I've got this certain way of doing things versus actually it's called the relaxation method. It's a three-step process. Let me explain it to you, Alex. Mm -mm -mm. One of those sounds much more impressive than the other. Mm, absolutely. That's it important does. of it. It does. Now, uh, a slightly controversial one, but I, I'll call it the, the bug in the room, not the bear. Uh, Omicron. Did the, oh, world, yes. <laughs> did the World Health Organization use this named process effect to make 
more tangible, more real, easy to communicate, you know, rather than they're in 251.472. You know, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely you've got to name these things and if you don't name it people will name it for you anyway so you've got to give it a name that's communicable and easy there's obviously a lot of talk about it being it's an it's a, a an anagram of no crimbo and all this kind of other stuff but i think that the name itself whether it was deliberate or not i don't know why they chose the name where that came from it does give this feeling of kind of like a baddie in a movie or like a, an evil overlord or something like that so it really has a negative connotation to it because it's quite hard consonant sounds in there whether that's liberal or not i don't know but that's definitely kind of the feeling i got when i first read it i was like wow i can almost imagine that it's some evil genius in his layer being called omicron and he's controlling everybody through the virus kind of thing so yeah. i don't know if that is uh, implied or not but that's the feeling i got and i think a feeling a lot of people get from that too yeah it, it's a very visceral one and it, it reminded me of uh, like starship troopers or one of those yeah. <laughs> like, oh my problem and it's coming and uh, yeah. um, and also in, interesting point sorry to interrupt you interesting point rather than just calling it you know covid 20 yeah. or anything like that by giving it an entirely different name we then have a different relationship with it if that was just mm -hmm. covid 20 or 21 or whatever you're like, oh well yeah we know about covid that's fine now it's got a different name oh mm -hmm. Perhaps it is different in some way, which they're saying it is. So it mm. shifts our attention. And this is the importance of language and names, and all this kind of stuff. So easy to miss, but can change mm. the entire course of your business and your communication. Mm. Absolutely. I've done that. <laughs> apparently, apparently it's to do with the, the Greek alphabet and they skipped two because they, they were too close to people's names. And that was then the next one. Right. And then literally that's how they came about it but yeah interesting <laughs> right let's talk let's just summarize what uh, we've discussed today and then we're going to come back to you james so first of all number one sell the destination not the journey remember people don't care about features um and then two on that uh, you're probably not selling what you think you are so find out what you're selling and it's usually something quite human and you know emotion driven um, and then think about how you would like to be treated as a buyer. And that's going to give you a good insight into how you should behave as a seller. Number two, trigger point. How to understand the trigger point for new customers is to find the trigger point for existing customers. And it's going to give you insights into when your customers want to buy and why they do it. And for the entrepreneurs out there, a trigger point for investors, especially EIS investors, is the tax year end January in the UK, January to March. Um, so that's coming up very soon for a lot of you. And then in terms of buying signals, identifying those, look for specifics in their questions and try and understand why they are asking the questions. And it's going to give you insight that, you know, this person is on the brink of buying. The named process effect. Uh, if you name your process, it does lots of things. But the thing I took out of it was it's going to imply confidence in your offering and give something, you know, something memorable to your customers. And then, um, focus on when you're deciding on a name focus on the end result you're trying to achieve and that's going to give you insight into what you should call your named process uh, in the name process effect and then you know it's probably a good idea to give something a name because people are going to do it anyway so rather lead proactively take a message from james's book and do that now james thanks again for sharing all those super valuable insights do you want to yeah. tell the listeners where they can find you and all this great content online yeah, absolutely. Best place to find me is on LinkedIn. So if you do a search for my name, James Newell, N-E-W-E-L-L, -E -L, you will find me. I share a criminal amount of content on LinkedIn every single day. And uh, for all the videos, my YouTube channel um, is found at uh, www.jamesnewell.tv. So if you go to jamesnewell.tv, take you straight to my YouTube channel. There's about four or 500 videos on there covering all this kind of stuff. And, it, and hopefully in a very easy, actionable, bite-sized fashion most of my video none of my videos really last more than four five six minutes mm, absolutely very digestible okay now on to quick fire q a as you said you're very active on social with at least uh, i believe 500 youtube videos in bite-sized portions uh what's uh, what's the driving force behind you creating so much content um i guess it's the just the democratization of it because i found something that it's really simple. I'm the first to acknowledge this is very simple, basic stuff that I talk about. It's just not common practice. Some of it has sophistication to it, yes, but it's quite straightforward to do. 
And it's just about me getting, excuse the pun, getting that message out there. So yes, I'll work with consultancy clients. They'll pay me. People buy courses and books and all that kind of stuff. That's great. But sharing as much as I can in the public domain for free is really important to me because I understand the difference it can make. And I understand just how pervasive the problem of communication and thinking that selling is a bad thing is. So this, is, this isn't going to be quick fire if I give you that long an answer every time, is it? <laughs> no, that's fine. No, I think that was that was a good length. Now, um, yeah, and, and I think just to, to dwell on that for a second, like a lot of people are really scared about giving out the information. They say, you know, uh, you need to pay for it. And I think uh, a lot of people are debunking that myth and you're going to be left behind if you don't share your yes. knowledge freely because... If you're good and you know what you're talking about, people are still going to pay you because you've got domain authority and expertise. So on, on that point, that's exactly what happened. So, and there's a very defined difference because I had this, this I said, oh, I can't, I can't give it all this stuff for free. Well, why would I do that? But there's, there's a difference. I can tell you what you need to do and I can tell you how to do it. So much of my content, much of the free content you'll see online is to tell you what you should do this. You, you should have a name for your process. That's great but I'm not really telling you how to do it necessarily. And I'm writing a book at the moment. There's 174 different ways to name a business product, service, process of working, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So there's a huge science behind it, but telling you what to do versus how to do it is kind of the demarcation of what's free and, and what's paid for. Mm, I like that. Okay, great. And you've mentioned the book twice now. Tell us more about that. <laughs> I've got a couple of books. The, the first one was the Clear Sales Message book. So back in 2017, when I started, I reasoned that if I could write a book about this and teach other people, then I would sufficiently understand it myself. Um, it is in for update at the moment because it's it's much more basic than some of the concepts I use now, but the fundamentals remain the same. Selling the destination, not the journey, and understanding that selling is just about communication. Um, and the next book that I wrote from there was called uh, How to Write a Tagline. And hopefully you can guess at what you'll get in that book. Taglines are something that are really important to help you to succinctly articulate in as few words as possible what to expect from a business, how it works or whatever. Very quick example on this one. I worked with a corporate travel agency a few years ago. They really look after their clients. They know them by their first name, know their preferences, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we've heard all that before. But how do we communicate that simply and effectively in a way that you'll really feel and understand? Three simple words, people, not passengers people not passengers that's how they approach uh, their business and from that you you'll put your own meaning into what you get from that and that's more meaningful than me just explaining to you that they know your favorite wine or whatever on the flight yeah hugely powerful and sticking on the clear sales message dreams and goals what's your end game your your, your destination it's funny because I was talking to a client yesterday about their end goals in their business I'm working with and their first answer was the answer I always give which is world domination it's as simple as that so for me, it's about digitally scaling my business to reach just much, much more people first in the English speaking markets and then beyond. But really, my, my main goal is to be globally recognized for, for what I do and to make a real impact because the stuff I do has such a huge impact on people. And it's so achingly simple once you understand it and you're aware of it. I'm just excited to share it with as many people as possible. Absolutely. That's great. Now, uh, taking a different tack to your best holiday destination. Ah, best. But I'd have to say Barbados because that's where I went on honeymoon with, with my wife in 2012. She's probably not going to see this, but if she does, definitely Barbados. Yeah. <laughs> did you go yachting there? Yes, we did. Yeah, did all, all the activities. Needed a holiday after it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds awesome. Now, uh, best advice for entrepreneurs, and I'm going to press you for one piece of advice. Yes, best advice for entrepreneurs is to follow your gut because we often stop ourselves before we actually really know the truth we think something's going to work before we truly know try things start dirty make a mess follow your gut just do something take action i like that very inspiring now finally anything else on your mind <laughs> well there's lots on my mind my mind if, if only you could see inside my mind it's it's an incredible world no that, that's it really i think that the main point that i wanted to get across today was just the simplicity of of the kind of stuff that i do and the importance of it the absolute importance of it if people don't understand your offering and you've probably got uh, colleagues family members partners who, i don't know what he does something with computers something in health i'm not sure if you've got any of those kind of people in your world that's a huge alarm bell that you need to address 
the issue of your value proposition, which I call your clear sales message, which is just a synonym for that because people don't really understand what value proposition is, but clear sales message, you can guess and you should be right. So if there's anybody in your world that's making those noises, and anybody doesn't understand, or you get the same questions again, the burden is on you to resolve that. And if you don't resolve that, it will have a financial impact on your business. Whether you use me or watch my videos, it doesn't really matter, but do address it. It's important. It sounds like you're most people's parents, right? I, <laughs> I need to brag to all my my ladies and and gents. Well, the, I suppose the the final point, and then I will I will stop. The final point that I want to make was about this this notion of guessing things. So when I named the business Clear Sales Message, I'm called that because you should be able to take a guess at what you think I do, and you should be right or at least in the ballpark. And that's half the battle won. If my business was called James Newell Consulting or had an abstract name or whatever then in commercial terms, I'm at a disadvantage. So you don't necessarily have to rename your business. When it comes to your messaging and how you communicate, could somebody guess and connect the dots when they're getting the information from you? Because that's how we communicate anyway. Mm. Yeah, well said. Great. Well, look, James, we'll stop there. Um, but people can pick up online on your videos and re-watch this um because i think it, it's not something that you can get in one episode um it's you know i've heard this once before and every time we talk i learn something more so um yeah really good thanks again and uh, we'll speak soon thanks for having me that's all for this episode keep tuning in for more exclusive content on how to succeed as an entrepreneur make sure that you follow the tippy top on all social channels including twitter tiktok facebook or now meta Insta, YouTube with at the Tippy Top blog and check out my website, thetippytop.com and you can also find me, Alexander Lee, on LinkedIn. Until next time, keep pushing and I'll see you at the Tippy Top. Cheers.